Bill jumped out of bed at the crack of dawn, got dressed quickly. He didn't want to be late for work. Since being laid off from his job months earlier, this is the first real day of work he had. He had uh, put in his application all kinds of places, but every time it seemed like he came, he came in second. But then his, uh, in his, you know, the family had a roof over their heads. They had food to eat. They had enough to buy some school clothes for the kids and supplies, but that was about it. They were already behind on their mortgage, and uh, both he and Nancy knew that if he didn't find work soon, they were going to be in trouble. Then his old boss called him, and he said, hey, I'm friends with this construction uh, owner, and uh, they've got a new job with Intel out in Hillsboro. They're doing something, and they're on a tight timeline. So he went over and talked to the, uh, the, the manager, and, and he got on. Pay wasn't great, no benefits, but... He agreed that they would work for $160 a day, and uh, they'd be, he'd be paid every day. So he got ready, and uh, it was going to be a hot day. It was like today. It's blue sky. It was going to be mid-90s, so he packed lots of water with his lunch, and off he went. He got there, and the manager pointed to a huge pile of debris uh, that, that heavy machinery couldn't get to, and a wheelbarrow, and a pick, and a shovel, and said, move it. And uh, first few loads went pretty quickly, the dirt, but then he got down to where these huge pieces of brick were and boulders, and he had to use a pickaxe to, to make it move. Sweat just started cascading down his forehead, and uh, he was drying himself with his shirt, and he says, wow, I wish I would have brought a towel. Then his feet started hurting, felt like steel wool been rubbed over his toes and his ankles, and he, man, I wish I would have brought a second pair of socks. When the horn sounded for lunch, he uh, crumpled down in front of a steel girder, which provided him a little bit of shade from the sun. And when he was just about done eating, the, the, the manager brought two guys over and introduced them. He says, they're going to be helping you in the afternoon. He was happy to have their help. With them helping, things went faster. And by 3 p.m., it was pretty obvious they were not going to get done with this mound uh, by the end of the day. A little surprised when the boss brought a couple other guys over just about an hour before quitting time. He said, they're going to help you for the last hour of the day. Then it was time to everybody get paid, and they lined him up, and they, they started by paying the guys that just came for the last hour, and he was really surprised to see him hand them a $100 bill and three 20s. He thought, wow, if that's what they got, I wonder what he's going to give me. Now, won't Nancy be happy when I come home with $500 for a day's work? And he was really surprised when uh, the guys that came at noon also got a $100 bill and 320s. I thought that was strange. And then he stood in front of the manager and he said, thank you for the job, appreciate the work, smiled at him. And he gave him a $100 bill and 320s. He says, hey, what gives here? Those goof-offs show up, you know, just for the last hour. They're probably out smoking dope and, you know, drinking last night and they're, they're sleeping in with hangovers and and they don't even break a sweat, and you give them $160? You, the same as me, and I was out here, my shirt is dripping wet. I got calluses all over my, my hands. What's the deal? I mean, if that happened to you, you'd be incensed, wouldn't you? Because we've all grown up on this ethic that says the longer you work, the more you work, the more you get paid. In Matthew 20, turn to it if you'd like, Jesus tells a parable that seems to fly in the face of this fairness ethic. I dare say this is the most intriguing of all of Jesus' parables. It's a parable in which Jesus introduces a new culture he wants to establish in his church. Churches that get it receive all kinds of people. Churches that don't turn people away, actually repel people. Let's stand in honor of our Lord Jesus Christ, the author of this story. Matthew 20, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About, <coughs> about nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, You also go work in my vineyard and I'll pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon did the same thing. 
About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard came to his foreman, called the, said, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the, then his famous line, so the last will be first, and the first will be last. Lord Jesus, speak to us. What did you mean when you told this story? And how do we apply it in the 21st century? Our minds, our hearts are wide open to hear what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So let's talk about this parable. Starts out, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day. A denarius was one day's wage in the first century. About nine in the morning, so the first ones were hired at 6 a.m. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. The assumption is kind of like, yeah, you'll probably get paid a little bit less. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. It was common during harvest season for a landowner to go to town several times to get workers to get his crops harvested before the rains came. So just like... Farmers today hire migrant workers or landscapers hire temps. This guy employed workers. About five in the afternoon, uh, the Greek in which this was written says, on the 11th, in the 11th hour, is where we get that phrase. 11th hour means ninth inning or end of the day, 5 p.m. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go work in my vineyard. These last men were surprised. There was only one hour to go. They expected to go home with nothing. They were bracing to hear the question, did you work today? No land or Lord issues a final hour invitation, does he? God does. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. Now each parable turns on a point of surprise. The surprise in this parable is that those who worked only one hour got a full day's wage while those that worked the whole day got the same full day's wage. They expected to get more. No one pays a full day's wage to a one-hour worker, does he? God does. Who would think to hire workers for $160 a day and then pay laborers who only worked one hour $160? Yes, that's what occurs here. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour. And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have a right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? Now, what can we make of this parable? Uh, if I ask you how you feel about this story, you would probably say you feel for the full-day worker. 
You identify with the all-day worker emotionally and intellectually. You have a basic value system that says you get out of life what you put into it. Bill Gates didn't start Microsoft with smoking dope and drinking Miller Lite. Uh, he was slugging it out in the computer room. Michael Phelps didn't earn record gold medals in the Olympics eating salsa and chips uh, in front of the TV all day. He was up at 5 a.m. headed toward the pool. LeBron James and Stephon Curry didn't become NBA stars by hanging around with the gangs in the neighborhoods where they grew up. They were in the gym and hitting the weight room. Thomas Edison defined genius as 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. We've been taught that students that study hard do well in school. People that work hard at their jobs get promoted. Yet it seems here that in one parable, Jesus is going to blow up this whole value system. Or does he? Peter asks in Matthew 19, 27, We have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? That's the statement of an all-day worker. And Jesus answers, And everyone who has left houses, brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. Jesus says, don't worry. Whatever you give up for me, I will give back to you many times over. You cannot outgive God. And then Jesus follows this up with this parable to illustrate his point. He surprises us in this parable. The parable is to our good. Here's the overriding theme of the parable. Our God is a gracious God. He's generous with the 11th hour workers. He finds people who are idle all day and hires them so they can support their families. He pays generously. In fact, it's his generosity that gets him into trouble and causes the all day workers to grumble. Uh, business people know you can't have two systems. You can't have hiring some people on legal contract and others on benevolence. So the method of Jesus appears commercially unworkable. All workers must be hired on equal footing. Yet that's precisely what Jesus does in this parable. He doesn't throw out the value of fair pay for hard work. He tosses out the whole system of contract and engages us all on the basis of grace. Jesus deals with everybody according to grace. Apostle Paul says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None of us are going to get to heaven on our own behavior, our own good works. Thank goodness God doesn't deal with each of us on the basis of strict justice. If he did, we'd never make it. I want to make three observations from this parable about our gracious God. One, our God is gracious with the 11th hour worker. Maybe you're wondering, if God gives a one hour worker the same wage as an all day worker, does that mean I can reject God my whole life, just play around, and then is, at the last minute give my, my life to Christ and go to heaven? According to the parable, yes. Deathbed converts and lifelong saints enter into heaven through the same gate. Some people struggle with that thought. A last-minute confession receives the same uh, grace as a lifelong follower of Christ. That doesn't seem right. People ask, if Osama bin Laden or Omar Mateen, the Orlando terrorist, received Christ at the last second before they died, and somebody else lives a good life, his whole life, but rejects Christ. Do they go to heaven and the good guy goes to hell? It's asked in such a way to make the gospel of Jesus Christ appear, appear ridiculous. But the answer is yes. If they accepted Christ, God could, could forgive them because Christ's death on the cross forgives all sins. God values Christ's death on the cross for sin so much that he can forgive everyone. Osama bin Laden, Omar Mateen, whoever. 
The prophet Micah asks, Who is a God like you, who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. David says, He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Request grace on your dying, with your dying breath, and God hears your prayer. Two, our God is gracious with the all day workers. A casual look at this parable might leave you with the impression that the one-hour workers were more fortunate. But the parable also shows that God is compassionate with the all-day workers. After all, he's the storyteller who adds the line, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. He empathizes with our concerns. It's true that the one-hour worker received a greater rate of pay, But Jesus makes it clear that the all-day worker received more. How? He had the assurance all day of having a job. If you've ever been unemployed, you know the stress you feel of wondering if you can provide. The assurance of a job is to have more. Jesus showed that those who were idle had less Verse 6, about 5 in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us. They were frustrated at not being hired. You may be wondering, why should I be a Christian my whole life? Why not wait until I'm dying? I'll live it up. I'll live the good life. And then it's the last minute I'll confess Christ. And I'll receive the same eternal life as lifetime Christians. Why spend my whole life being an usher, working in the, the tech booth, being part of the band that gets, has to get here early to practice, teaching the, the children in the kids' space, or being a youth leader, or trying to live a good life? Why do all of that? Get this. Your reward is that you get to work all day with the Lord of the vineyard. You get to be with Jesus longer. Sometimes people who've been in a church a long time unconsciously resent new people who come to the church. If you've been with us since the beginning, uh, since we began this church a few years ago, you know, you've been involved trying to help us get organized. You've helped this church get off the ground financially. And maybe you sacrificed to help us remodel this this building. Then someone new comes in and you think, where were you during the heat of the day? Where were you when we did all the hard work? We scrimped and saved and sacrificed. And then you waltz in and enjoy this just like everybody else. What's right about that? Jesus answers, I've been more than fair with you. You've been with me all these years. You've had the privilege of serving me. That is reward enough. You see, being with Jesus is the reward. The 11th hour workers got less. When people make last minute confessions, they always express regret. All those years they missed out on knowing Jesus. They got less. Knowing Jesus a long time is a privilege because Jesus is so good to us. In March, Jory and I were watching a movie one night and I got up in the middle of the movie and I I bent over to pick something up from the ground. I got this horrible pain in my abdomen. And I said, Jory, look up on your uh, cell phone. Uh, What's appendicitis? She looks it up. I had it. I said, let's go to the hospital. Got to the hospital, they said, you got appendicitis, you're going in for surgery. After I got out of the hospital and the whole deal, several people said to me, told me stories about friends of theirs who had appendicitis and it burst and they died. I don't know how they thought telling me that was supposed to feel helpful. (laughs) My point is, I'm not a 
hospital type of guy, you know, or just jump and go to the hospital quickly. I'm a, I'm a buck up sort of guy. And uh, I think God prompted me to, you know, you need to go and save my life. Our son Mark signed up for the military and he served two tours of duty in Afghanistan. When he got home, he said, Dad, it was nuts. I swear our sergeant was trying to kill us. He would drop us off in a plateau with all the Taliban in the hills and the Al-Qaeda just around shooting at us. It was just stupid. We are so grateful that God brought him home and now he's in college. God is gracious with the all-day workers. Three, God, our God is gracious, so he wants us, like he is, to be gracious toward others. Now this last observation is a harder one to listen to. Jesus directed this parable to religious leaders who, like the all-day workers, were indignant that Jesus was opening up the kingdom to 11th hour workers. They didn't like that he was opening up the kingdom to prostitutes and tax collectors. This is what we call a double-edged parable. There's two stories in it. The first story is about a landowner who hires people at 6 a.m., 9 a.m., noon, 3 p.m., 5 p.m., and he pays them all a full day's wage. The second part of the story is about the anger of the all-day worker. Say, hey, what gives here? This isn't fair. Jesus says, are you jealous, angry, because I am gracious to people? Who are far from God? Shame on you. I and my Father are always welcoming 11th hour workers, and so should you. It's unfortunate that often those who are closest to Jesus and longest with him often misunderstand what he's doing in the world. Jesus is seeking people far from God, even to the 11th hour. Not only do some of God's people not seem to care about reaching people who don't know God, but they seem to resent God's grace toward people they see as goof-offs and prefer to seem to want to go back to a merit system. Rather than being gracious to people who have made mistakes, they appear all too ready to condemn them and shuts the, shut the doors of the church to them. Jesus says, I'm seeking lost and hurting people until the 11th hour, and so should you. Jesus says, I've not dealt with you on the basis of merit. I've been gracious to you. Now I want you to treat other people the same way. You'll meet all kinds of people who have made mistakes in life. They've been promiscuous. They've gotten into drugs and alcohol. They've made financial, you know, stupid decisions now. They're all messed up. He says, don't condemn them. Love them and be gracious to them. Just the way I've been gracious with you. Be welcoming to all people. God wants us to be welcoming and sensitive to every guest who comes to our church. Cult cultivating a warm and friendly attitude is so important to a church. We all have to keep our eyes open to notice who's new. General rule is somebody you don't recognize. And the most important time in the service, you know when it is? It's the first five minutes after the service ends. We all have a tendency to talk to our families, talk to people we know, and the guests can just kind of slip right out the door talking to no one. Ritz-Carlton Hotel has been voted the best service in the hotel industry for years running. They empower their staff to do whatever they have to meet the needs of a guest. They don't have to get permission from a boss. They allow them to, up to $2,000 a day to meet the needs of guests. It's, it's really unbelievable. Here are some of their service values. I am always responsive to the expressed and unexpressed, unexpressed needs of our guests. I'm empowered to create unique, memorable, and personal experiences for our guests. In other words, I don't need to get permission I own and immediately resolve guest problems. You see the problem, you deal with it. You have the authority. So I, I want to tell you that 
I want all of you who are members, regular attenders, you call this your church. I give you authority to deal with problems other people face here. Uh, a guest needs something. I'm not going to give you the $2,000 deal, though. <laughs> It'll be your money. Um, but we want you all to know that you are empowered to be gracious. Our God is a gracious God, so we must be gracious and see that we care about each person who darkens the door of our church if we're to be a strong and healthy church. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this parable. We see that you are a gracious God. You don't judge us on the merit system. You're gracious with all of us. And you want us to be gracious as well. I want to give you a moment to pray. Just everyone here, just silently for a moment. Maybe you feel like the 11th hour worker. You really haven't dealt with Christ. You came in today and, man, I don't know too much about it, but you've heard enough that you say, Jesus, I want you. I want your grace. I can't do the merit system. I never can be good enough. So I want you in my life. Would you come in and be my Savior? Or maybe you're a believer and you say, you know, I get the point. I need to be gracious to other people. I'm kind of maybe judgmental, condemning of others. I don't want to do that anymore. I want to be very gracious like God has been with me. Maybe that's your commitment today. Whatever it is, I'll give you a minute to pray. Everybody pray silently. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being a gracious God. You are so good to us, better than we deserve. And we thank you for that. Help us to treat other people the same way you treat us, with grace. In Jesus' name, amen.